for the younger folks in the audience, that was a, uh, a very popular movie played long ago in a faraway place. Oh, that was Star Wars. Oh, well. You guys even remember the gavel. Wow. The committee will come to order. The Oversight and Government Reform Committee's mission, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know that they get from their government work that is tirelessly in part, I'm doing well. <laughs> they have a right to know that they get from their, what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring general reform to the bureaucracy. I'd like to begin by apologizing for that opening statement. <laughs> now, I, I would like to thank the City Council for making this wonderful room available to us. Uh, I also appreciate the uh, witnesses for being here. Field hearings are a way to allow us to come to you in a setting of your choosing. Additionally, I think back in Washington, we often talk about the Silicon Valley, we don't think about it. So for the members and staff that will be here in the next few days, touring here and rest of California as part of the, this series of field hearings, we hope that we will see members get informed both by your testimony and on, by being in a community where innovation, is not marked by the size of your handbag, your Gucci shoes, uh, your lobby effort, but in fact by your willingness to innovate, to bring people together to find new and exciting products, often intangible and unthought of before they were invented here. It wasn't long ago that na the nation's research, innovation, and high-tech industries were unequaled. That is no more. As the debate shifts to how to repatriate dollars from around the world, every day we're reminded that revenues outside the United States are continuing to pile up, looking for opportunities and often finding them to invest in foreign lands. Who are we to blame? Five years ago, Bill Gates and many others warned of the negative impact of strict caps on H-1B visas for technology workers in the U.S. With the competitive environment around the world, if you can't get your worker here, you'll go to where your worker is. Just last August, former HP CEO Carly Fiorina said that it is time to start acknowledging the reality that companies go where they're welcome, explaining that U.S. federal policies such as high corporate tax rates and the broken immigration system the failure to have a permanent R&D tax credit for many years pushed jobs overseas instead of making U.S. companies competitive against their international rivals. Uh, at Intel, uh, uh, Paul Otella said, I can tell you definitely that it cost $1 billion more to build a factory here and equip it than it cost outside the United States. 
and I can tell you my stockholders are not going to ask or order me to spend one billion more be in, in before al attributing higher labor cost. America's cost of energy continues to be a concern to Intel and other companies, along with other burdens and delays. I've heard these concerns personally here in December and on other trips to the Valley, and in my home in San Diego, the same is true. Telecommunications jobs once thought to be based out of San Diego as a home of innovation, little by little, are finding homes in other countries with smart and innovative people innovating the next generation. Many of those new jobs, of course, will be in China. On top of that, federal agencies continue to have uh, inoperable uh, databases, databases that cannot, in fact, be easily searched. It's not that we don't spend money on them, we spend a fortune on them. The real question is, will the federal bureaucracy come to Silicon Valley, ask what it can get from them so that it can start acting more like a cloud-based Google search than, in fact, the often pretty websites that deliver little or no information, have broken links, and seldom are searchable in a mass way. This committee continues to, uh, uh, to explore waste, fraud, and abuse in government, but we also believe that the greatest waste is in fact the job that does not get created in America, the opportunity does not occur. That will be a bigger impact on America than the undeniable waste in the federal bureaucracy. With that, I'd recognize the gentleman from Utah for his opening statement. Thank you, thank you Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I, I was actually born in Los Gatos. I, I grew up uh, in part uh, in Saratoga. I, I remember when Norm Mineta was the mayor, for goodness sake. So uh, I only lived here until I was about seven years old, but nevertheless, uh, this is home. This is where it all started for me. And if only my dad had kept those that home in Saratoga and those rolling hills overlooking the, the vineyard, uh, which are now scattered with these multi-million dollar homes, but nevertheless, and, and that beach house in Santa Cruz, but that's another discussion. I Listen, I... Uh, By the way, there, there are plenty of opportunities to run right here in this <laughs> district. <laughs> I kind of like the conservative voting pattern of Utah's third congressional district, but um, nevertheless, I, uh, I, I fundamentally believe that our federal government right now is borrowing, taxing, and spending too much money. It's startling to me that 25 cents out of every dollar spent in this economy is spent by the federal government. That is unsustainable, it's unacceptable, and it is far too much. We need to recognize that it is the private sector that creates jobs, the federal government doesn't create jobs. The federal government is there to, uh, there's a proper role for the federal government, it is there to provide safety and security and do things that are uniquely government. But if we're going to grow our economy, if we're gonna to continue to be the world's military and economic superpower into the future, we're going to have to change the way we do business, and we're going to have to recognize that until we create a, an atmosphere that is conducive to the growth of jobs, we will continue to struggle. Now, the tech sector has obviously been wildly uh, successful, and particularly uh, in, this, in this area, but we need that to expand. We, we need that to grow. We need to remember that manufacturing is good, <laughs> that we actually have to make and develop things. And the United States is unique in that it has such a talent and a penchant for creativity and for developing things. And there's nothing uh, more proud than some of the companies that are represented here that have become global brand names in a very short amount of time. Nevertheless, I am worried about the federal government and its policies moving forward. How do we propel and make sure that these companies grow in their strength and everything from patent reform to cloud computing to cybersecurity to standardizing of data to uh, shared services? These are all things that not only affect how the federal government will operate, uh, but will also have a dramatic effect on how business around the globe will operate. And so I think one of the, one of the core challenges, and I hope we have a discussion today, Chairman, about is this, this idea of the federal government and its unilateral rulemaking authority through the executive branch as opposed to going through the congressional, uh, uh, through the, the process of the United States Congress. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you recall, when, when uh, the House Republicans were gathered, uh, George Will, one of my favorites, he came and spoke to us, and he said uh, his, his perception was that the challenge before the 112th Congress was whether or not Congress was gonna stand up for itself. Where are we going to allow the president and the executive branch? And I'm not trying to be overly partisan here. It certainly was true in other administrations. Of um, is the 
executive branch going to unilaterally be able to, dis to use its rulemaking authority to have the effect of law, or is it going to be the congressional record that will be most pertinent? We have to go through a deliberative process of openness and transparency, bipartisan in the nature of, of the way Congress is configured, uh, to actually develop those rules and put them into law. And there is a difference between rules and the law. And yet, I feel like in sometimes, not only in the tech sector, but also in everything from the ag sector to the EPA to the FDA, as we were talking about earlier, this is obviously, uh, all Americans are affected by what is done through this unilateral rulemaking authority without the public's input. So, nevertheless, long-winded way of saying, uh, the tech sector is, is one of the things this country can be proud of. It is providing real, tangible jobs. It will provide the income that is needed, not only for the federal government so it can offer its services, but provide the type of growth that will allow us to continue to be the world's economic and military superpower. And so that's the, 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 the notion of the hearing today is understand how we can help by getting out of the way, what are the impediments uh, that the federal government is putting up so you can continue to grow and expand in the tech sector. And then how do we learn in the federal, <laughs> the federal government, we have one department that just got off DOS for goodness sake. Um, and so we're, we're 3.3, 3. Wolf, 3. <laughs> 3. 3. yeah, they get an all green screen. Um, and so, um, nevertheless, um, we appreciate your participation today. I look forward to a healthy dialogue. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. The chair now recognizes our panel of witnesses. Mr. Patrick uh, Quinlan is Chief Executive Officer of Rivet Software. Mr. Milo uh, Medin is Vice President for Access Services at Google. And Mr. Stuart McGee is the National Technology Officer for Microsoft's U.S. Public Sector Organization. Pursuant to the rules of the committee, all witnesses will be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear, or please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony we'll give before us will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record sh reflect that all witnesses answered in their affirmative, and please be seated. Now, the next part of the script I actually get to go off of. Although your time is limited and we want to be uh, respectful of it and, and we have other uh, appointments for the day, these are comparatively informal uh, opportunities to express back and forth a dialogue. So I'd, li I'd like to have each of you make an opening statement, approximately five minutes. No one's going to cut you off, particularly if you're speaking rather than reading from a script that will be placed in the record in its entirety, and then we'll begin alternating with a, a group of questions. And Brian, if you have specific questions uh, on behalf of the minority, uh, we're certainly going to include you in the questioning. Uh, again, allowed by the rules, but not often done back in Washington. And with that, uh, Mr. Quinlan. Congressman Chaffee and distinguished members of the committee, uh, my uh, name is okay, when I, when I botch all the names, and I do it all the time, I apologize, but uh, Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz, I apologize. Has the record. No, no, he <laughs> has the record for the fact that the previous chairman actually never got it right once. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Mr. Chaffetz, um, as, a, uh, as a resident of Colorado, I, I certainly don't mean to demean my neighbor in Utah, uh, much less point out that we actually have better snow. Than, than the fine state of Utah. Go. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Patrick Quinlan. I'm the CEO of Rivet Software. Um, we have 570 talented members of our team, uh, which has been a tremendous growth. Uh, a year ago, we had less than 50. Um, we currently serve over 1,250 of the top public companies in the United States, including uh, Microsoft sitting here to my left. Um, we are very passionate about data transparency and what the power of information can do in allowing Main Street to get the same access to information as Wall Street gets today. You asked how federal reg regulations and policies impede the creation of high-tech jobs and how government agencies can instead leverage new technology to achieve greater efficiencies, reduce waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement of federal agencies. 
Today, the federal government is constraining innovation, wasting funds, and obscuring information, all in the name of data transparency. Data transparency initiatives such as data.gov, recovery.org, and usaspending.gov give the impression that the government has made data available and accessible. The U.S. government has funded these tools to provide answers to the public questions, but they don't suffice. In fact, they have created a guise that constrains innovation, wastes money and resources, and actually reduces transparency. Until data reporting standards are set and the public has access to the underlying data, the data that really matters, it remains nearly impossible to provide answers to the public's questions. But we don't have to rely on these government programs. Private companies can compete to provide data in a standardized format, delivering increasingly high value to the public. A new self-funded industry will be formed, high-tech jobs will be created, and true transparency and accountability will be achieved. Setting standards leads to lower cost, increased sharing, and enhanced communication. Sometimes standards evolve gradually. Let's think about Betamax and VHS. But this takes time and increases cost and waste. Mandated standards can be more effective and efficient. Take, for example, the recent SEC mandate around XBRL. XBRL is extensible business reporting language, a language that makes document contact machine readable and therefore instant, instantly available for research. The SEC's visionary van mandate for XBRL has so far created at least 15 companies and 1,500 jobs. At an average salary of $68,000 a year, that means over $100 million in salaries and approximately $30 million in taxes per year. What can the federal government do to create true transparency? First, take a look at the SEC for best practices. They have set and enforced a standard that developed a self-funding industry. Our government must find more opportunities to mandate data standards. Use of standardized data will let the government manage by exceptions focusing on the outliers. Imagine asking for every purchase or order exceeding budget by 20% and having the answer instantly. With this kind of data, we'll no longer attempt to predict questions. Instead, we can enable innovation and let the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Rivet, as well as so many of the other companies in my industry, um, through their growth. Let's consider GPS for a second, which was originally created for military use, and look at the and look at the many applications that have been created by leveraging this data. How many businesses have been created? How many jobs? How much revenue? How many tax dollars have been returned to the government as a result of industry's access to GPS? In this time of massive deficits, let's stop dealing with fuzzy numbers and start tracking where and how our money is being spent. With access to standardized and structured data, we can use facts, not spin, to make decisions and determine if our money is being wasted. In conclusion, Please trust us to work with you and the Commission to bring the benefits of true data transparency to the American people. If we do it right, we will start a whole new industry, creating tens of thousands of high-quality, high-paying jobs, while answering the need to reduce spending and waste in our government at the same time. On behalf of my company in Denver, the thousands employed by our industry, and the millions of Americans we serve, I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh Medin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lightfoot and Assistant Chairman Chaffetz, um, for this opportunity to discuss the ways in which government regulation can sometimes hold back uh, innovation and investment. Uh, my name is Milo Medin. I'm Google's Vice President for Access Services. Uh, in that role, one of the things I'm responsible for is leading the Google Fiber team in the build out of an ultra high speed network in Kansas City, Kansas. Prior to joining Google, I co-founded M2Z Networks in 2005 and served as, as its chairman and chief technology officer. Before then, I co-founded At Home Corporation in 95 and uh, served in a number of senior positions there. Uh, in my view, there's a demonstrated need for the federal government to revisit some of its foundational processes and procedures to ensure that we are creating an environment that is friendly to both uh, investment and innovation and uh, the corresponding economic growth and job creation. At Google, we also see a need to modernize government by updating our patent system and by taking other steps to ensure that companies continue to invest and create jobs. I'll start, though, with some of uh, the experiences I've had in the interplay between uh, business investment and regulation. Google Fiber uh, recently announced that we will work with Kansas City, Kansas to deploy a large-scale, ultra-high-speed uh, network at speeds up to one gigabit a second. Uh, our goal in Kansas City is to provide 
uh, at a competitive price, internet access that is more than 100 times faster than uh, what most Americans have available to them today. But my experience uh, deciding where to make our investment highlighted for me just how regulation can sometimes get in the way of innovation. Uh, my written testimony discusses a number of areas, but in my statement today I'll talk about rights of way. Uh, governments across the country control access to rights of way that private companies need in order to lay fiber. And government regulation of these rights of way often results in unreasonable fees, anti-investment terms and conditions, and long and unpredictable build-out timeframes. The expense and complexity of obtaining access to public rights of way uh, in many jurisdictions increases the cost and slows the pace of broadband network investment and deployment. Reducing red tape, overly restrictive uh, regulations, and delay associated with access to rights of way would make, one, would make a big difference. Luckily, some local governments get it right and are good examples for others to follow. Uh, in fact, part of the reason we selected Kansas City uh, for the uh, Google Fiber project was because of the city's leadership and, the, 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 and their utility move with efficiency and creativity in working with us to create a, an agreement. Uh, I'll step back a little bit from Google Fiber to discuss my views on the impact of regulation uh, innovating more broadly. Specifically, I'll touch about uh, some regulatory issues that concern me personally that relate to the FCC and government in general. Um, first off, the government generally must strive to be more efficient in its decision-making processes and recognize that time is in many ways the most valuable thing we invest here, we invest in Silicon Valley. Starting a regulatory process that may affect specific sectors in a market, either in a positive or negative way, creates ambiguity that can often freeze investment. Uh, it's important that such processes are optimized for speed and not, and so that the ambiguity involved uh, can be removed as quickly as possible. I once heard Colin Powell uh, say that all good decisions are made between 40% and 70% of, uh, of information. He said, if you have less than 40%, you really don't know what you're doing. Uh, but if you have more than 70%, you've waited too long. Uh, if Silicon Valley companies like Google fully embrace this sort of thinking, and it's essential to our ability to deliver innovative products that compete worldwide. But investment disincentives are created when we have to wait on government processes that are not time-bound and materially impact which products we can develop. Agencies like the FCC all too often open up rulemaking dockets soliciting formal comments, receive a flood of documents from interested parties, and then fail to act for months or years if they act at all. Uh, the result is uncertainty, which is bad for business, bad for innovation, and bad for investment. Uh, fixing the patent system is critical to the technology industry, and while I have not had as many patents issued to me as uh, you have had issued to you, uh, I do have a few, uh, and probably like you, I have seen the patent process work well and have seen it work not so well. Uh, simply stated, the American technology industry's success depends on a functioning patent system uh, that produces and protects quality patents. In recent years, the system's become difficult to navigate. Frivolous lawsuits built around patents of dubious validity and targeting the, pro the profits of true invention. Uh, companies often settle rather than uh, risk losing millions of dollars in front of a jury. And consumers' innovation and economy suffer for it. I know that you understand this, Mr. Chairman, and want to thank you for your support in, uh, uh, of a supplemental ex ex examination amendment issued uh, uh, by uh, Chairman Goodlad during the markup last week. I'll close with this. If regulations create disincentives for large, well-established companies like Google, just imagine the impact on small and medium-sized companies who uh, include the next generation of entrepreneurs who are just getting started. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. You're more up-to-date probably than most of my colleagues in Congress. <laughs> Let's just hope that becomes law this time. <laughs> it is interesting you. that you quoted Colin Paul and not Michael Paul. Uh, hopefully he lived up to his father's 4070 during his time as chair. Indeed. Mr. McGee. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Nissa and uh, Congressman Chaffetz and the distinguished members of the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Microsoft Corporation. My name is Stuart McKee, and I'm the National Technology Officer for the U.S. Public Sector Business at Microsoft, and it's a position I've held since 2004. In this role, I do work with governments across the country of all sizes uh, on, the wor on working on effective technology policy. We thank the committee for convening today's hearing, and at a time when our country is facing significant economic challenges, it is essential that our government take advantage of information technology best practices, and it is imperative that we pursue policies that support innovation and growth. 
In my testimony, I'll focus on four areas uh, in which government and industry each has a role to play in driving progress towards policies that can promote IT innovation. One, information security and the new FedRAMP program. Two, a policy framework to facilitate a responsible move to cloud computing. Three, international trade and respect for intellectual property. And four, the H-1B visa program. Let me begin with the important topic of information security and share our experience. Microsoft is proud to be a world leader in information technology security. At Microsoft, trustworthy computing is a core value, and the Microsoft security development lifecycle, which the company originated and followed, has been widely praised, published, and practiced by governments and companies around the world. It is noteworthy Microsoft has security programs and trusted partnerships in place specifically for governments, including the Government Security Program which provides national governments with information to help evaluate the security of Microsoft products. Two, the Security Cooperation Program, which focuses on computer incident response, attack mitigation, and citizen outreach. And the U.S. Government Configuration Baseline, which continues to be one of the most successful IT programs in the federal government to help increase security, reduce costs, and accelerate the adoption of new technologies. Technology continues to advance rapidly, and it's no surprise that stagnant information security standards and protocols are not acceptable. The Office of Management and Budget and the General Services Administration are driving a new effort known as the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program, or FedRAMP, that aims to streamline, strengthen, and secure cloud implementations across the federal government. Microsoft welcomes this effort, but we urge Congress to oversee the process to ensure that it meets the policy objectives established by the Congress in the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. In particular, FedRAMP must be consistent and fair with a process that is repeatable, adaptable, and immune from preferences or bias for particular vendors or technology. There are challenges posed by the program as proposed that warrant deeper discussion. We look forward to working with OMB, GSA, federal agencies, and other stakeholders as related issues are considered. Moving to my next topic, looking beyond government use of cloud computing services and to facilitate a responsible transition for all customers, policymakers should examine emerging issues related to privacy and security including those arising outside the United States with regard to information that crosses national borders. In this context, we urge Congress to consider legislation that would, one, require cloud service providers to make their privacy and security practices transparent to customers. Two, ensure rigor in federal government procurement of cloud services by requiring agencies to evaluate providers' security practices. Three, enhance criminal enforcement of computer crimes, such as malicious hacking, and allow cloud providers to bring suit against violators directly and four, encourage the federal government to engage in international efforts to promote consistency in national laws governing access to and security of cloud data. A comprehensive approach to cloud policy will help ensure that consumers and enterprises fully realize the exciting benefits of new computing technology. That brings me to international trade. While IT technology is evolving rapidly, so is the global marketplace for U.S. IT products and services. With 95% of the world's consumers living outside U.S. borders, international trade is becoming an increasingly important element of a U.S. pro-growth economic and trade strategy. Microsoft advocates using existing trade agreements, including the World Trade Organization and free trade agreements, to enforce intellectual property rights, expand trade, and ensure that the U.S. IT industry remains competitive. Looking to the future, we urge, one, swift passage of the U.S. Korea, U.S. Colombia, and U.S. Panama free trade agreements, Two, negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And three, maintaining a strong focus on stemming IP theft outside our borders. Microsoft faces a significant challenge in the rampant piracy we face in China and emerging markets. In spite of these challenges, we strongly believe the best option to con is to continue to advocate for the opening of new markets and strengthening the rules of disciplines of trade, particularly with regard to intellectual property rights. Finally, I would like to turn briefly to the ongoing debate regarding the H-1B visa program that is critical to our success. Throughout its history, our country has operated on the principle that the more brain power we can attract from around the world, the more creativity, invention, and growth we can achieve here at home. There seems to be a re-emerging and bipartisan consensus that we need to stick to this principle, and we welcome it. We strongly support efforts that will facilitate the ability of information technology companies like Microsoft to attract, hire, and retain the best and brightest innovators from around the world. If we are not allowed to do so, our international competitors will. Again, many thanks to you, Chairman Issa, Congressman Chaffetz, and the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. We look forward to working with you to address these issues and confronting the IT industry, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And as promised, uh, we'll be a little less formal, but uh, I'm going to start in reverse order. 
isn't the H-1B program essentially a failed program because it, it brings people in on a temporary non-immigration status? And the truth is that if these people work out, we really need them to be able to re remain permanently. Yes, I assume you're directing the question at me in reverse yes. order. Um, yeah, I can, I can speak specifically for my own personal experience in some small startup companies as well as uh, the Walt Disney Company and Microsoft. Uh, attracting the best and brightest from around the world has been incredibly important to us. And the ability for those individuals to come to the United States and create businesses and stay here, um, to be clear, these are people that show up and pay taxes and help us fund roads and schools and the other things and contribute uh, to our economy uh, significantly. So uh, I, I would agree with that statement that having people stay here is very important. Mr. Medine, would you say that uh, realistically we should be giving a, uh, a green card application to every graduate uh, with a master's or PhD from our major universities and uh, particularly in science and math? I, uh, uh, it's funny you asked me that question. I, talked I, I didn't you. invent it. I actually took it from Thomas Friedman. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> I, it's, a, it's a great idea. Uh, I brought it up with uh, uh, the House leadership when I was uh, uh, back in Washington in March for TechNet Day. Uh, I think if, you, if we are uh, really serious about competition, the last thing we want to do is encourage people to come from all over the world, learn at the feet of the best uh, professors, the best uh, innovation apparatus in the world, and then send them back to their countries to form companies that compete with us. It is just ridiculous. And coupling it to the boiling the ocean problem of comprehensive immigration reform is a big problem in our mind. Uh, it's what I came to Congress for 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I have to stay till we solve it, or until <laughs> I die. <laughs> Mr. Quinlan, when, when you talked about XBRL, trying to put it, quantify it, is XBRL really the success, or is it in fact that you have metadata that is that allows for data to be searched and compared, no matter how different it is, if it uses that format? And I guess my follow-on question is, shouldn't this committee look at mandating the kind of, of, of searchable, verifiable, this cell equals this cell, this information equals this information across uh, the, uh, the government. In some cases, XBRL is, an, is appropriate. In some cases, other types of tagging would be appropriate. Isn't that fundamentally what the SEC is now doing, that up until now you had to be uh, basically able to take divergent databases and compare them, and it was an inexact science? Uh, that is correct, and actually the, the example I'd like to give on that is the difference between data availability and data transparency. They seem very similar, but it's a pretty tremendous gulf between the two. Data av availability, I will use a past SEC mandate, which requires all companies to submit their financials in HTML. HTML brings the smallest element down to the page. So it essentially makes it so that when computers came out and became wildly available 20 years ago, that individual investors could turn on a computer and read their financials by the page online. So that was a, a progressive, intelligent mandate 20 years ago. Um, what XBRL, and that's data availability, now it's there. What data transparency is, is when you allow individual numbers and items to be compared across multiple companies, multiple industries, and you do that utilizing an open standard that is non-proprietary, such as XBRL. What the SEC mandate requiring XBRL now makes it possible for individual investors, Grandma in Dubuque, Iowa, to instantaneously access the filings of companies and compare that information across industries much the same as the largest companies in the United States do today. So we fully support the expansion of XBRL into MDNA and 8Ks and all forms of public submissions into the SEC as well as as progressive as HTML was in its um, original version 20 years ago, we actually think that the HTML mandate inhibits the growth of XBRL because there's still this lingering connection to this document-based system rather than a database system. So we encourage, A, the expansion of XBRL throughout both the SEC and the federal government, as well as the elimination of the now obsolete HTML. Uh, were you disappointed when, uh, when you saw Dodd-Frank basically have no data standards at all? Yes, sir. 
I was outright <laughs> disturbed. So I just well, first of all, we um, we at Rivet would like to thank you for your constantly pushing this issue. Um, you know, I was actually given an example on data um, transparency um, uh, just this morning. So imagine if you have a hundred thousand buttons, and those buttons are in a big drawer full of cabinets, and they're all different shapes and sizes. What data availability does is it says, here's 26 questions you can ask about the buttons, which is what data, um, is, which is what the um, recovery.org website does today. It says, here are the 26 questions you're allowed to ask, and here are the specific answers to those 26 questions. That's data availability. And trust us, all the information is correct, and it's all about these 100,000 buttons. Data transparency is giving everybody full access to those buttons and allowing them to ask the questions that they want. And so the disappointment we felt over that being stripped out of the Dodd-Frank bill is we were going back to what we got with, um, with recovery.org where the government gets to ask the questions and provide the answers that they think we want rather than our ability as citizens to be able to go in and ask those questions. So it was a disappointment, and we look forward to your leadership in being able to push that forward in the 112th Congress. Well, thank you, uh, and we will we will continue to push that on a bipartisan basis. Last question for, uh, for this round, Mr. Medine. Now, Google is is pretty famous for uh, the Google search, and if I uh, <clears throat> if I search on my name or on Jason Chaffetz's name, I I first get a default of a whole bunch of stories about him, or a whole bunch of websites. But if I click over on the side and I do image. I get uh, uh, mostly Jason's pretty face. Uh, not always, because it appears as though that the data tagged to his face is taken out of the data of the articles in which it appeared. How long before the private sector, Google and uh, uh, Microsoft and other innovative companies, have the face recognition, which already exists, tagged so that they can find Jason, when he occurs in so many different places, tag it and apply metadata that not only is who he is, but who he was with, uh, what the setting was, so that instead of looking at an article 50 times, 50 different articles from the same appearance, if I tag I, and I want that information, I can find out who was at the forum with him, uh, what, what, what occurred, maybe who was there at the committee that day and, and what votes they made. And the reason I ask that is, when you have that data, if we embrace it, suddenly what we have is the ability to, and I'm looking using face, even though sometimes that'll worry people, government doesn't know who is cheating us. We don't know that a vendor is the same vendor that cheated us twice before. We don't know that, uh, a, uh, a you store it in Des Moines, Iowa, is in fact not a major hospital that suddenly started billing us millions of dollars. How long before the industry on its own is going to be able to collect, analyze, and apply metadata to an awful lot of different occurrences that can be leveraged to, quite frankly, root out the hundreds of billions of dollars in losses of the government? fascinating question. Um, you can I, expand for the record, too. If you <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, I, uh, I think that's a, a great idea. I, uh, um, that's a part of Google that I actually can't give you real good uh, answers to, but I think we will take Just that in as, Internet quarters is all I want an answer. Yeah, with. exactly. Uh, we will, uh, I will uh, have uh, folks come back and give you an answer to that question in a couple weeks. We are pretty good at being able to put the... the uh, smart people in front of problems and come up with innovative solutions. But I, I'm not, I'm not uh, an expert to, expert on the metadata stuff. Excellent. Well, uh, and and we'll continue to ask Google and Microsoft and all the other and, and Rivet those kinds of questions right. because we don't know how today to stop wasting your money. Because if we knew how, obviously we'd already be doing it, right? Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> we do, we we do know some of the ways we're not doing. Right. Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you. Uh, let's, back in uh, 2009, uh, the Obama administration put forward the Open Government Initiative, uh, which uh, the result was the development of this data.gov. Um, and one of the comments that Google had made is that it wasn't as crawlable as it, uh, as it should be. Can you give me your perspective on what's happening or not happening with data.gov? Um, I, I, again, that's an area where I'm not... Uh, 
I'm not really familiar with the core data. So we do, will we do will either back. either of you want to comment on what's happening or not happening in that day? Sure, uh, Congressman, I would be happy to comment. Um, I've actually been uh, somewhat prolific in in blogs and my uh, personal appearances talking about data transparency, public records, and have actually been a big proponent of public records in the digital age for quite some time. Um, the, the interesting issue is I think all too often we focus on technology and we focus on uh, shiny objects and, and technical solutions to problems where uh, unfortunately some of the old adages are still true today, garbage in, garbage out. And all too often we don't take time thinking about uh, the data or the information when it's collected. And it's really important that we do that. I'll speak specifically to the stimulus process. Uh, I helped uh, develop and put together a system that we gave away to local governments primarily called Stimulus 360 which was understanding my own personal experience as a state CIO during the Homeland Security cycle, how difficult it is for governments to try and deal with federal money coming down the pike quickly. And Stimulus 360 was about just putting tools in place so governments could collect data efficiently. Then the reporting process on the other side uh, becomes much, much easier. Uh, in the case of data.gov, the, the interesting thing for me personally, and I've written a lot about, data is nice, but if you organize it and create information, it becomes meaningful. And, and all too often, more data, it's my opinion, is not the answer. In fact, more data reminds me of, of, of why we created the Paper Reduction Act, uh, because we realized government was producing more and more reports and producing more and more paper that nobody was reading. I think, unfortunately, in some cases, we're producing more and more data for the sake of data and producing less information. Uh, and I think it would be really important for Congress is to take a look Is that in contrast or compatible with what Mr. Quinlan was saying? I think it's very much in, 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 in compatible, very compatible with what he said. His, his argument was really about our ability to actually organize information and produce it in, in a way that it's meaningful so it can be organized into information. And I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I would. Go ahead. Important to understand, and I think where we are in, in, in strong agreement is that we believe the user should be given access to the data so that they can formulate the question that they have. So this is building KPIs around information. This is building business rules, whether that's on government data on, on, or on um, company GL data. If you give the user the ability to formulate the question, we believe they'll get the answer that they want. But that only works if all the information is in an open standard so that everybody can access that information equally. Now, how difficult is it to make that sort of transition? Because every time we try to you know, talk to some federal agency, it's, oh, well, we're going to need billions of dollars. To how, how difficult in terms of time and dollars is it to make such a transition? Question, how, you know, yeah. how, high, how high is up? Uh, you know, it kind of depends. I think the reality is this is less a technical question and more about a process and procedure and uh, demeanor of an organization. Um, I think we're, everybody agrees that we're quickly transitioning from a, you know, produce paper reports kind of uh, environment to ca cap capturing data and producing data and allowing people with tools at their disposal to organize that data into meaningful information. So is data.gov, is it worthless? N no. I, is I, it moving in that direction? Yes. Th as fast or as rapid or as well, is it moving I, I mean, in the right I, you know, I, it, you, know it, you know candidly uh, congressman you know i'm a taxpayer i'm out here i'm a private sector citizen it, it never moves as fast as i would like it to um, and i think there's opportunities for us to improve and we have a lot of incredibly my personal experience in government what's it a, not doing right let me ask you in the negative there um I, for, for me i think we're too focused on producing data part of the uh, part of the agenda is let's produce more data and it's less about producing quality information question congressman chafis is in the 2000 largest publicly traded companies in the united states have converted their html document based 10 qs and 10 ks into a data driven XBRL methodology for a sum total of about $40 million. 2,000 companies now provide that information for about $40 million is the aggregate value of, of that industry in its current life cycle. And that's on an annualized basis. So if we can take 2,000 disparate companies with many disparate accounting systems, all have different accounting codes, create a common taxonomy, and ask those companies to report against that taxonomy, we have evidence of that cost. Um, now, I am certain I was just handed a, a, a spreadsheet of apparently the reporting system within the U.S. government. And it's yeah, yeah, that was for my next round of right. questions. Uh, and it's, and it's uh, potential By the way, that's, that's not complete. I just, it's, <laughs> it's such just a small page. page. <laughs> 
Um, but if you look at, and, and, and I think that's what is important, these are 2,000 separate companies um, that have done that for that cost. So I think that to assume that the cost is even close to equal to the benefit is a very short-sighted view of this. Um, the amount of money we could save by providing correct information um, greatly outweighs the cost. And, and either of your, uh, any of your uh, perceptions and experiences, any federal agency, we talk a lot about the SEC, but above and beyond that, anyone doing it right, anybody who's just the most frustrating federal agency you can possibly imagine, your own personal experiences. Name names, we're, yeah, we're, just, we're friends okay, here. here. We, we need targets. Get kicked. Uh, yeah. You know, I, actually, I, I would like to say that, um, you know, there is a lot of incredibly good work happening. Um, and I, um, you know, uh, the, the, the move towards transparency, I think, is incredibly important. I think citizens expect it. You know, we have access to our investments, our 401ks, information, maybe too much information coming at us every day, people would argue. But I think the, the federal government has made a lot of progress uh, moving to a more kind of transparent environment. And I would like to see, for me personally, the, the pressure, if you will, continue, that the expectations that this is a journey, not a destination, continue, and uh, you know, continuing to see that progress move forward. How about, that? How about that for an answer? Yeah. Specifically answer your, is data.gov, is, is it the correct solution? I think when you look at the Pony Express was a dramatic increase in the ability for people to communicate over what came before it. Um, you know, FedEx is a bit better. Um, so I think that we could view data.gov as kind of the Pony Express. It's, it's good, it's a start, <laughs> but there is probably a better way to do it. <laughs> Understanding that, that we're still back in the Pony Express days, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I'll go back for this round. <laughs> Pony Express, well, it, you know, that was a, uh, an ill-conceived way of delivering mail quickly that did only lasted a couple of years and killed a lot of ponies. Uh, <laughs> Again, the reason I chose the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the problem is we glorify things sometimes that, that don't work out, but they, they seem like a really great idea at the time. That, uh, that chart I gave you, I gave you for a reason. Uh, we're, we're looking, obviously, a big part of the reason we're out here today is to talk about impediments to job creation, and I want to get to a couple of them, but uh, when I look inward at the government, that reporting matrix, which looked actually like healthcare reform, uh, it was so complicated, it, uh, it's a small part of what we've analyzed along with uh, Earl Devaney, the chairman of the recovery board, uh, for how reporting for presently happens. And then there are three charts that on the other page that are three visions, and they're really the only choices government has other than the one of doing nothing. Uh, we can try to tie together these various uh, divergent bases and reporting and, and, and hopefully uh, not spend too much money asking people nicely at OM, from OMB and, and others to deliver information more and more in a in a, in a usable format, and they'll all tell us, as you can imagine, that they have these legacy issues and they can't do it. The other two are either to simply start taking the data today and saying, going forward, we're going to do this differently, which is a single point reporting concept, or obviously say, look, give us your bases and we're gonna put them together. Uh, the reason I put those in front of you is we can have data or if you will, metadata tagging that allows disparate databases to be moved together in some sort of a legitimate way where the data that can be compiled. But in the day of the cloud, shouldn't we look at our 2,500 plus, and what's the actual number, guys? Oh, I'm sorry, 2,094 different data centers and ask the question of if they're not, if they're not designed to be interoperable and if we're looking at reporting as not designed to be interoperable from the moment that it, it begins, aren't we inevitably going to be having this discussion 10 years from now? Yes. <laughs> and, and I'll take any no's if, if you can figure out how we would get there except by essentially coming up with single uh, a concept of single point reporting. And when I say single point reporting, they can go to dozens of databases, but one standard setting 
element so that what what is put into the flow of government reporting is in fact thought of from the get-go to be interoperable. And I think, so what you just brought up is a key, and that's creating, I, the starting point of that is actually um, not technology, but it's creating a, um, a government-wide taxonomy that takes those disparate 2094 technology systems and forces them into a single reporting structure. Um, that taxonomy, just as we've seen in the public sphere, will inevitably have a certain number of extensions. Some companies um, have extended up to 30 or 40 percent of all the numbers inside their financials. Well, you're going to start to see, though, as a group think that pulls that back because the last thing that a company wants to be is an outlier. And I think that would happen in the government as well. You're going to have some departments that will play by the rules very well. They will fit their reporting structure into that common taxonomy. You're going to have other organizations that tend to think that what we do is so incredibly special that we have to extend a lot of things. And when every extension begets 26 questions, you're going to start to see those extensions come down. So step one is a common taxonomy. Um, then using an open standard to, meta, to tag with metadata against that transparent, uh, against that um, uh, taxonomy is going to allow this. You don't have to go all the way back to the data source to correct this if you can get it into that open standard. Other comments? I would just add, I, I really appreciate you bringing up the idea of interoperability and understanding. I mean, the reality is 20 years ago we made the best decisions we could, right? And the reason we, we implemented the technology we could, and the reality is we built large uh, bureaucracies and operations around those systems. And the real challenging part is less about ripping out a water wheel and putting in an electric engine or a new technology and more about reshaping uh, that organization. If I could also belabor the Pony Express uh, analogy. <laughs> um, the, the other interesting thing that I think you'll find that we're, we're faced with, a great example is our data networks. You talked about uh, cloud computing. Um, you know, in, in the federal government in particular, we have very often redundant uh, networks. We have data and voice networks. And one of them happens to be incredibly expensive and, and, and somewhat dated. And there's a, a significant opportunity for the, the federal government to improve with unified communications and, and things like this and understanding that you know, what we traditionally bought this infrastructure for, we've, we've surpassed that ability. And what that does for us ultimately is allows us to share information and data quickly and more efficiently. So to your question, you said, are we going to have this conversation in 10 or 20 years? The answer is yes, because we're increasingly creating more and more information and more and more data, and certainly we'll have new challenges to face in the future. But much like the conversation we had 10 years ago, we talked about data dictionaries. And when we created these databases, you use the word taxonomy. I'm a database guy by my engineering background. We talked about data dictionaries and using things like FASB and GAP and other accounting standards to create uniform, you know, uh, you know, vocabulary for how we describe the data and information. Um, that problem is going to be with us in 10 or 20 years because we're going to have more and more data. But we need to continue, and we want to ask Congress to continue to put the pressure on the federal government to adopting some of these new technologies, taking redundancies out, like my, you know, data and voice networks, and looking at, you know, how do the new technologies allow us to take and create some more efficiencies to remove friction, if you will, moving information around the government. And I'll follow up on that that with a question to your, your comment. Is there any reason that when we look at gap accounting and other accounting, that government truly has to continue having its own separate accounting system that does not port back and forth. Is, is it a worthwhile goal to say that a, a good accounting, core information provided that can be re-manipulated a hundred different ways is really the goal so that, and, and my point is this, the SEC does not report its operation in the way in which the corp corporations that it oversees report their operations. The only thing we know for sure, though, is that the SEC actually does not have the internal controls because they failed their own audit and have now farmed it out. So sort of along that line, when we're looking at source information, if you will, reporting that Mr. Quinlan can compile three different ways, he can compile it in a typical GASB type, you know, Okay, we're going to expense everything. We're not going to depreciate. We're going to we're going to continue. We're going to recognize revenue differently, and so on. Or by simply saying, "Give it me the other way," you couldn't you and shouldn't you be able to say, "Well, where is the federal government if, in fact, you use gap accounting and you you say, "Well, wait a second here. What is the asset purchase? What is the useful life?" 
obviously in government accounting, they don't even need that information, but isn't, isn't in a sense all accounting simply rolling up source material and shouldn't we, we go to common source material? Yeah, so now, now I'm reaching way back in my history, which isn't in my oral testimony, and I don't think it's on my, my, my bio, my undergraduate but, degrees in management accounting, before I realized that uh, you know, running a 10 key during tax season was not, uh, was not my future. And of course, well, you're was, showing your age talking well, 10 key. Well, you know, I was incredibly fortunate as well. I could show more of my age that, you know, computers and PCs were, were happening. And I spent a lot of time in the computer lab and I'm a geek and was, it, was exposed to computers and realized, you know what, I would rather apply principles to computing and some of the business knowledge I have. And but anyway, uh, neither here. So nor in yet. other words, you don't have a Fiden adding machine with all those rows of buttons in no, your office. No, ten, ten keys are great, and you know, and calculators are great. But uh, the computing technology, you know, clearly here is infinitely more powerful than anything I could have imagined at that time. But to your question, you know, business principles that have been true for thousands of years are still true today. Uh, you know, technologies evolve and change, but some of these core principles still matter today. And I think your question was specifically, shouldn't we have consistent and common ways to report and account? And I would say yes. Um, and very often in my own experience as a government CIO and a public official, uh, we complicate things significantly through the budgeting process. And very often we say things like, well, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. Government's different. Uh, in many cases, there are things that are unique about the government. Let's be honest. Sometimes the government is in businesses that nobody else in their right mind would be in. Right? People's lives depend in very often what we do, and that's understandable. So, you know, issues, privacy, security, whatever, are incredibly important. But when it comes down to basic fiscal accounting, I think there's a lot of improvement that could happen and a lot of consistency that could be created. And my last question, uh, my last comment is going to be, candidly, if government needs to learn the difference between spending and investment. They, they seem to be interchangeable in most of the dialogue that you hear. Uh, Mr. Medine, you, you, you did hit a, a point that I want to hit one more time. The federal government ultimately has huge jurisdiction over right-of-way and can probably clear an awful lot of right-of-way directly and through persuasion, uh, uh, you know, in, in, because we regulate so much. But if the federal government did all it could do within its federal powers, what would we, you suggest for the states and the local uh, in order to clear what's left. You know, we, we do not historically take on purely private property. And, uh, you know, the railroads, some of these other areas, we could help with a lot. But assuming we do A and answer what you think we should do from a federal standpoint, and then what would we be asked to encourage our brethren at the uh, state and local level to do? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, the, the rules that the government imposes on federal projects have uh, all kinds of uh, requirements. Uh, Senate, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo and uh, uh, Senator Kublikar had sponsored a conduit bill, uh, which would have required uh, on all federal highway projects that conduit be placed in those projects so that at a later time, fiber could be pulled uh, through those uh, at substantially lower cost, 95% uh, lower cost. Um, Things like that, that basically create holes in infrastructure when you're building it, it costs almost nothing to install the conduit and greatly removes the, uh, r reduces the, pro the uh, price for actually installing infra uh, telecom infrastructure in that uh, later on. Also, things like siting uh, all wireless base stations on federal office buildings, uh, how GSA uh, negotiates with uh, commercial uh, leaseholders, right, so that when uh, the GSA is leasing uh, a space in the building, does it also have the ability to put, allow third parties to put wireless base stations, telecom infrastructure on those properties? Um, the U.S. Postal Service, right, has a lot of uh, land, a lot of uh, various uh, buildings. Would, indeed. It would be nice if you could get uh, easy uh, ability to put wireless base stations for cellular coverage and all of those uh, installations. Uh, on the state and, uh, and, and also the FCC in particular controls access uh, for the rules for pole attachment and a whole set of other uh, criteria for telecom operators. They did a recent, their recent uh, proceeding was a step in a good direction, but it didn't address really uh, what it means for pure broadband providers who don't fit into narrow um, 
uh, Title VI or Title II uh, uh, labels to gain access to those polls. And in terms of state and locals, um, I sat on the California State Broadband Task Force as well as a number of TechNet in initiatives on uh, broadband and right-of-way. There's a whole host of things that you can do. Uh, conduit everywhere uh, is, is so that when 